how it's going to be. <laughs> so I thought we'd start this afternoon by reflecting on forgiveness and the meaning of forgiveness as a complementary quality, another aspect, if you like, of patience, really. And of course, patience is very helpful in the forgiveness process, too, because we can't always forgive our own or others' mistakes, things that have happened in the past. We can't always just let it go straight away. It is possible, but it's harder than that for most of us. So as I said earlier, the forgiveness is an aspect of letting go. You could see it as a, a type of renunciation. And of course, you have to be wise about what you renounce in life. So we renounce the things that hurt us. We renounce the things that are not, no longer serving us to hold on to, right? We renounce those resentments, grudges, hard feelings from the past, or at least we can develop the intention to renounce, yeah? That's what uh, right uh, intention means. It means it's an intention. So we can't perfect it overnight. And forgiveness also um, involves a lot of metta and a lot of compassion, the other aspects of the right intention of the Eightfold Noble Path. And as I said, it's strengthened by understanding causality, that we are a product of causes and conditions of all our past experiences in life. Um, there's a very lovely quote that I read. Have I written it down somewhere? I'm sure I wrote it down. Um, and I think, yeah, here it is. It really helps me to understand how we are just a product of our conditioning. And this is about trauma, but you could actually replace the word trauma simply for conditioning. And this is by somebody called Resma Menukem. I didn't have a chance to look who that actually is. But they say trauma decontextualized over time looks like personality. Trauma in a family decontextualized over time looks like family traits. Trauma in a people decontextualized over time looks like culture. But as I say, you could replace that with conditioning. Conditioning decontextualized in a person, in a family or over time in people looks like personality, family traits or culture, right? And I think this is very liberating because it, it sort of implies to me that if we would have had similar situations happening in our life, we may be just like that person, maybe a person who we can't understand, a person who we can't forgive. You know, sometimes we can see in the news terrible things happening all over the world and we think, how can people behave that way? It, you know, how can there be so much delusion and, and hatred in the world? But we don't know how these people have been brainwashed, have been conditioned, you know, have been instilled with fear. So... When we understand that, I think the process of forgiveness becomes fairly easy um, because we know that people are basically trying to do the best given the conditions that they're in. Even people you know, involved in, in genocide, sometimes they actually think they're doing the right thing. Of course, this is great delusion because they're really missing the fact that they're harming so many beings and harming themselves. But um, sometimes the conditioning is so strong that we're conditioned to see our fellow human beings as threats or even as terrorists, right? I read um, of one military member in, in Myanmar and he actually defected, um, having realized you know, the massive harm that's being perpetrated on peaceful protesters. And he said that they are conditioned, they're brainwashed by the leaders of uh, the military to perceive the peaceful protesters as terrorists. So you can see how this gets very complicated. And now some of the peaceful protesters are joining the ethnic armies. So they are then going to be in the eyes of others and actually in reality, terrorizing some other people. So it's a very, there's almost nothing that really divides ourselves from anyone else in this regard. You know, sometimes we can just consider ourselves fortunate that we've never had to be in situations with such heavy ethical choices. But before I get into any of that, which was totally unintended, <laughs> I wanted to just define what forgiveness actually is. And the best definition that um, I came across is from somebody called Piero Ferrucci. Um, he was a disciple of uh, the person who founded psychosynthesis. I forget their name now. But he has this lovely um, definition. He says, forgiveness is making peace with the past 
and finally closing accounts. That really touches me because it's the act of making peace you know, with the past and finally closing accounts. We're not keeping score anymore. And it's important to understand that forgiveness is not for others. Forgiveness is for ourselves. Other people don't have to deserve our forgiveness. You know, by forgiving, we're not condoning um, the harm that's been done. We're not denying how hurt we are. We're not excusing them or dismissing our pain, trying to pretend it never happened. None of that. But we are making a conscious decision to release feelings of resentment, feelings of anger and, and ill will and consenting to the process of forgiveness, embarking upon a journey and being open to that journey, no matter what unfolds along the way. So the process of forgiveness is not always going to be easy because you will have to encounter your pain, your hurt, and find a way to respond to that with a great amount of compassion and patience, right? A generosity of spirit, a generosity of heart. So forgiving is also one of the most beautiful ways of giving. We forgive others. We have this spirit of generosity, of trying to put ourselves perhaps in their shoes and understand that perhaps they were doing the best they could with the conditions at that time. And it's the same thing with ourselves. Another lovely quote I came across is from Maya Angelou, the um, author. And she says, forgive yourself for not knowing what you didn't know before you learned it. <laughs> <laughs> and it sounds kind of like, huh? Forgive yourself for not knowing what you didn't know before you learned it. <laughs> How can you know it before you've learned it? And it's because you didn't learn it that you didn't realize. So it also changes our attitude towards making mistakes, right? Because mistakes are where we do learn, or where we do grow. And as I say, you know, if we can have compassion towards ourselves, self-compassion, lower our expectations and, you know, meet failure with a sense of loving kindness, a sense of compassion towards ourselves, it's actually teaching our nervous system to recognize failure as safe. Yeah. So most of the time we're afraid to forgive. We're afraid because or we're afraid of making mistakes because we know that we won't be able to accept ourselves or maybe others won't accept ourselves, you know, or maybe we'll react in such a way that makes us very tense, very stressed. But if we can instead meet those mistakes with self-compassion, with charity, with a sense of amnesty, <laughs> goodness me. I mean, even the Buddha harmed others. Even the Buddha was not liked by everybody, right? So who are we to think that we can never make a mistake, that we can never cause hurt or harm to another? Even enlightened teachers, they say things that, you know, maybe they, what does Ajahn Brahm say? The more you speak, the more you put your foot in your mouth, the more opportunity there is, right? I do it too, you know. I mean, it's impossible not to do it, even if I was completely purified and never had any trace of anger or ill will. There'd be no way that I could avoid hurting others simply by, through being alive. But that doesn't mean it would be my fault. That doesn't mean that I would need to beat myself up about it, right? Because I too only know what I know after I've learned it. And I think that brings us to the point that, you know, anything in samsara is only going to be good to a certain extent because just the very nature of being alive and living in this body, living in this very unpredictable, unruly mind and the nature of the world, with all its you know, um, impermanence, all its um, laws of nature, you know? um, even the environment, even the world itself is being destroyed. It, you know, we're going through a mass extinction, I think, is it the third mass extinction? Nothing can really be reliable, can really be relied upon. So how can we expect this world to be perfect? And for me, certainly um, one of the impulses or, or things that I don't know it's hard to say because I think ordaining is a calling like I can make a story about why I ordained but to be honest it was a calling from the heart but I do know that I went through a logical process of trying to look into the world and say is there anything here that I can really do something with is there really anything I can make out of samsara if you like and to me, it looked as though we can only really have happiness to a certain degree. 
because ultimately we're going to lose those we love. We're going to meet misfortune. If, even if we have a perfect life, perfect marriage, perfect job and family, which I don't know anybody who has that, even then we're going to be parted at death. And even if we help the hungry, we you know, try to reduce, um, say, child abuse or all the beautiful charity work we can do, still there's going to be suffering just by virtue of being alive. And that is in no way meant to say that we don't do our best. We do our best to help relieve suffering wherever we see it. And we shouldn't turn our eyes away. You know, you can say, oh, well, I just won't see it then and look in another direction. But that's not the path, right? The Buddha told us to turn towards suffering and to learn to respond compassionately. But for me, it was like very clear that a total end of suffering would come by actually going, getting out of samsara, getting out of this repeated cycle of birth and death. You know, if that doesn't resonate for people here, because you may I mean, you're not monastic, so perhaps you wouldn't go so far. But even this idea of the cycle of birth and death can be interpreted in different ways. The Buddha was very clear in saying that this means physical birth, physical death. But even in our lives, we go through phases, we go through cycles. You know, we might get depressed, then recover, then again get depressed again, and then find a little way out. So we're going through these cycles all the time. And eventually, I think, you know, there comes a point where we realize that the only place I'm going to find true happiness is deep inside. You know, it, it's through purifying my mind, through trying to um, overcome, eradicate to whatever extent we can this greed, hate and delusion within ourselves. Yeah. But that doesn't negate the fact that in that process, as we're purifying our mind, we can do more and more good. And that's the other meaning of life for me, you know. So samsara is not perfect, but while I'm here, as long as I'm here, I can do the best I can. And if I can forgive my mistakes, it makes me a lot more courageous about what I'm willing to attempt to do, yeah? If you can only try to do things where you're assured of success, then your life is going to be very limited, very um, diminished in many ways. So overcoming for, um, resentment towards ourself requires a lot of self-compassion. You know, there are all kinds of practices on self-compassion, you know, which involve meeting our pain, meeting our suffering with an open heart and, and actually wishing for ourselves, may I be free from suffering? You know, realizing that that is possible, that freedom of suffering is something we deserve and something we can actually experience. And then of course, overcoming resentment to others is something that many of us will be struggling with or working with a lot of the time because there are people in our lives who we feel a natural affinity towards there are others who we simply don't get along with and find it difficult to find any good in them sometimes it's those people who are so dear to us who when they do harm us the resentment goes even deeper you know if you're hurt by somebody who you're really close to that can be very hard to get over and the Buddha likened this resentment and ill will to a kind of boiling water. You know, he said that when the water's like boiling, if you imagine that, how can you see an accurate reflection of the situation? Your mind is churned up, you know, with anger and ill will. It's the hindrance, the first hindrance. And because of that, you can't see the situation clearly. Like in English, we have the expression that our blood is boiling, right? I think that's quite similar to what the Buddha meant by this boiling water. Ooh, it makes my blood boil, <laughs> which of course, if it was actually happening, would actually kill you. But uh, there's another simile, you know, of the hot coal that the Buddha uses. He says anger is like having, um, like trying to throw a hot coal at somebody else. You know, by picking up that hot coal, you really do a lot of damage to your, the skin on your hand. Right? So you yourself are the first victim of your own anger. And I think it's really obvious we can really experience that. And the other problem with it, of course, especially when it turns into resentment, is that we dwell on something that happened. We go over and over and over it in our mind. Also in the suttas, there's, um, I'm not sure whereabouts it is in the suttas. It could be in the Anguttara threes, but the Buddha says that um, there are three, I think it is three kinds of people. And he said that there are those whose reactions whose sankaras or whose anger in this case is like a line drawn 
in rock, like chiseled in rock, you know, with a hammer or a chisel. So it's really deep and it's, it's going to stay, right? And then there are those who have anger, which is like a line drawn on the sand. So it stays for a while, maybe a whole day, but then the tide comes in and washes it away. And then there are those whose anger is like a line drawn on water. I'm not sure if he said water or the sky actually, but I think probably water because it's a matter that you can sort of separate, but it just immediately comes back again, right? So you can't, uh, it doesn't last basically. And interestingly, even um, in experiments, they found, uh, they did this experiment, I think in the nineties, I'm not sure when this book was written. Um, and they divided people into two groups. No, no. What they did was have a group of people and they got them to reflect on somebody who'd hurt or harmed them in their life, even abused them. And I think measures were taken, you know, to control how, how severe that hurt or abuse would have been. And, uh, and they examined their brains, you know, under the machine while they were reflecting on this. And they found that the results showed that there are people who are high forgivers and low forgivers and the people that find it more difficult to forgive had much higher stress levels and, and worse health. Whereas the people who could forgive easily, more easily, or at least embark on the journey of forgiveness, they had less anxiety, less depression, and much better health. So I, I like these kind of findings because it just confirms what the Buddha was saying all along. And it's something that in a way is very obvious, right? We can feel when we're getting upset that our heart starts to pound. Even sometimes it just hurts. You know, I, I noticed recently I was feeling hurt by something and I was meditating and sort of feeling my body, feeling my chest area. And there was like this hollow sort of sensation in my chest almost as though I'd been punched. <laughs> and then when I realized that, I just you know, gave myself a lot of compassion. And I was like, okay, this is the sadness monster, like a big fuzzy wuzzy sort of Muppet or big bear. The sadness monsters come to see me. And uh, you know, my job here is just to allow them to stay for a while as long as they want, you know, let them in. So then everything around you, that softens, the body softens, the feelings soften, and sometimes there may be tears or a sort of melting away of something that could potentially turn into a hardened state of anger. Because when we resent and we just churn it up constantly in our mind, we're actually building suffering. We're constructing suffering, you know, the way you would construct a building, you know, putting a brick on and making a really strong foundation and then you know all the stories and the thoughts around what happened just build that building higher and higher so in the same way forgiveness is actually the opposite it, it starts to deconstruct and it really softens the mind one of the most amazing things i've seen around forgiveness was um, a video i saw a while ago there was somebody in America, I think it was a young boy, and he'd got involved with the wrong crowd, you know, as, as can happen, right? That terrible conditioning of when we're not surrounded by spiritual friends, but we're surrounded by people engaging in wrong things. So he got in with them and uh, it led to the murder of another young man who I think was a uh, Muslim. And, uh, and they went to court about it and it was just such a moving clip. I wanted to find it for you before the session, but I didn't have time. You might be able to find it on YouTube. But basically uh, uh, this family, you know, with the boy who's murdered and the, the family of the, of the murdered boy, the father was a devout Muslim, um, were meeting there in court. And the father of the murdered boy basically said, I forgive you. I forgive you, you're my son, he said, to the murderer of his own son. And then that person actually went up to him and he gave him a hug. They embraced and the families were crying, you know, feeling so incredibly moved. And it's just extraordinary, isn't it, that, you know, such things can be forgiven. And the wisdom that goes along with that, realising that, you know, holding on to that anger doesn't serve anyone. It's just going to spoil your life. My mom told me a story recently, actually, about um, somebody who's, again, a murder. I think their daughter was killed. And, uh, and for 40 years, they were trying to fight for justice, this word fight for justice. 
And uh, basically they said it had ruined their life. And they kept saying, you know, only when justice is served can I forgive. And that didn't happen for 40 years. So in the meantime, that person has literally, you know, wasted their life. And who knows if the justice in the end will really change the course of that person's mind. So it's very difficult. And I'm not saying forgiveness is easy. I'm not saying I have any clue what that kind of suffering is like, you know. But um, I read a really lovely book by um, Desmond Tutu and his daughter Umpo Tutu. I hope I pronounced her name correctly. Um, but in there, it talks about a process of forgiveness and talks about four um, stages. So I thought I'd share those with you um, because it might be of interest and of help in your own journeys. And uh, it really shows how this process of forgiveness is an intention that requires, as I say, courage. It requires patience, but it also requires a lot of honesty, a lot of integrity and being honest to your own pain your own hurt so it starts by telling the story this is number one tell the story so we don't suppress what happened we talk about it we get it out you know even the most terrible things because it helps us make meaning of what happened you know it stops us just pushing it under the carpet and in that telling there's already a healing process happening and the telling of the story starts to change the story over time you may remember different details. Um, you may be able to frame things differently, frame your own position in that differently. And then the second uh, step is called naming the hurt. So we name the hurt, how it hurt me, and really do it, you know. I think as Buddhist practitioners, as Dhamma practitioners, we can go one step further than naming the hurt and actually start to gently come in contact with it. But I do want to say again, this is where the aspect of gentleness is so key. Gentleness is a part of patience. Yeah, Patience involves gentleness. So we don't just plunge straight into the most difficult places, whether the difficult story is a difficult pain, but we just gradually, gradually learn to experience how it feels in our body, how that hurt feels, especially when we're the thoughts about the story come up or what happened to us and if it's too intense we can expand our awareness and keep it say on the extremities this was something I got from my first teacher Goenka we used to um, sit for very long hours so most of the time it was physical pain we were working with but of course it's very connected to your emotional reaction um, and you learn to differentiate the two so you'd be sitting there and sometimes you know you just have to move out of compassion but other times you would just learn to actually um, develop patience towards difficult or uncomfortable unpleasant sensations and one way of doing that was to go right inside it and really examine what was happening all the different textures and layers of that um, intensity but the other one was to go to the extremities and just rest the attention on the palms and on the soles of the feet because those areas of the body are always quite um, pleasant quite neutral sometimes maybe there's a mild tingling or but it just expands the mind. There was another retreat I did after leaving Perth when I was really, uh, it was like 2016 and I had no idea of the next step. There were a few days where I just felt like I was in a, a void and didn't know how to go forward or back or it was very strange. And, uh, and luckily I had an invitation to do a retreat just in someone's house who'd rented an apartment in Lanzarote <laughs> for those who don't know it's an island off uh, between Africa and Spain and uh, and while I was there I had a lot of uh, kind of doubt and fear and a sense of ah what have I done I've decided not to go back to Perth my visa was cancelled you know there was no way of going back to the training there um, and I had to find a new way forward for my monastic life and so there was this sort of sense of closing in like a sort of quite heavy feeling and I remember just noticing how because the mind has this negativity bias to kind of close in around suffering and pain I would just try and expand it out every time I felt it was like getting compressed getting contracted just expand it out expand it out and most of that three weeks I was just working with like this very nice sort of um, peripheral experience of the body so just expanding it and then even expanding it beyond there I guess it's a kind of emptiness practice realizing that you know this body is like and this mind is it actually goes beyond this peripheral body right 
and we can experience something wider. We can open our mind to a sense of space, a sense of um, emptiness, where which can hold all these difficult emotions. And by the end of that three weeks, my whole energy was completely different. It, it was really extraordinary. I could feel totally different and my family responded to me very differently. Um, and from there, I felt like I almost had this clear path ahead. So lots and lots of energy freed up to go into the starting of this project. So this uh, forgiveness, it really softens the mind and we need that softness to come in contact with the pain. And then the third step in the forgiveness process is called granting forgiveness. So obviously that's the bit that we all want to get to. But as I say, it's a journey, it's a process. You may never get to that point, but at least you can have the intention, may I learn to forgive, may I learn to forgive. May I be open to the forgiveness process, yeah? May I be patient and allow it to take its own time. So the granting of forgiveness is, it says in this book, it's like you step out of the victim mode. You know, they hurt me, they did this to me. In the Buddha's text as well, the Buddha said, oh, there's this way of thinking. They abused me, they, you know, violated me. And such a way of thinking only uh, increases the pain, increases the hurt. So we step out of that victim mode and into the heroic mode, who, the hero who is able to put things down, not the hero who is able to attain and get a goal or, you know, say, yay, I'm sitting through pain. I'm getting to get for, into the jhanas today. That's why I came to this retreat. You know, that's not heroic. That's egocentric, um, goal oriented craving, actually, in many ways. But the heroic effort is to actually let go, to put things down and to have the courage to do that, because sometimes we do create a sense of self, even around the things that have hurt us the most. You know, I am the person that struggled, that had a terrible childhood. I am the person who was abused. In a way, that's true. But in, a, in another way, you're not a fixed person. Abuse happened but you can start to step forward into a different interpretation, a different, a more heroic mode. You know, right now, right this minute, we're not being abused. You know, if anything, it's our own minds that torment and torture us, right? So this is really the issue. So we start to take some kind of agency, autonomy again for our life. But again, I mean, it's hard to use those words because in Buddhism, we're not claiming that we can control our life, but we do understand that our response to what happens and to whatever's arising influences the direction of our life. It influences um, whether or not we're moving towards the wholesome states increasing, or we're moving towards unwholesome states, just manifesting and, and increasing in our minds. So that's always the guideline, really, with the right effort. It's not about how much effort you make, but which direction is it taking you in? And then the last uh, step in this fourfold forgiveness process is to either renew or release the relationship. So this is, of course, about somebody else. We can't, well, I guess we can re renew and release the relationship to ourselves as well, actually. We can renew it, we can decide to treat ourselves differently, right? But we can't really release it unless you want to completely change your relationship overnight. We have to live with ourselves. But in terms of other people, I think it's important to understand that forgiving somebody doesn't mean you have to invite them into your life. Ajahn Brahm has this nice phrase, loving the tiger at a distance. And I think that distance is so, so, so important, especially when people have really hurt and harmed us. There's somebody in my life like that, and it's 10 years, 11 years now since we met. Largely circumstantial too, but I, I'm not quite ready. You know, I'm not quite ready, and I don't know if I need to be, because my process has already happened, or it's continuing. I think a large part of it is, has been achieved. And that happened mainly through the practice of loving kindness. And not interestingly, it wasn't even loving kindness directed to that person. It was just general loving kindness that eventually started to include her too, spontaneously. 
So the Buddha says that the five ways of um, overcoming resentment are basically loving kindness, which is the antidote. If that doesn't work, we use compassion. Yeah. So we can understand that, okay, this person struggled in their life. You know, they're also suffering. Instead of judging them, we can try to put ourselves in their shoes. And also compassion to ourselves. May I come out of this pain? Or may I, first of all, meet this pain with kindness? Yeah. And then, so loving kindness, compassion, and then equanimity. So as usual in the Buddhist text, you start with the first one. If that doesn't work, try the second. <laughs> yeah, so sometimes equanimity is all you can do. You're not going to develop fuzzy wuzzy feelings towards this fuzzy wuzzy big giant monster of pain. <laughs> but you can be, you know, you can develop a sense of acceptance, a sense of equanimity, um, whereby you can feel that, you know, you can take the distance that you need, you can take the space that you need. And then the fourth one is interesting. It's to actually, um, it says in the suttas, the way it's translated is to ignore the person. But I kind of think of it more like not giving them undue attention. And I can really relate with that in terms of things like reading the news. You know, how many of these stories do you want at the forefront of your mind? Because we talk about spiritual friendship and the importance of wise friends. But if you've got, you know, the TV on with some type of politician's face blaring out and saying horrible things, you know, destructive things, then you're associating with that person for that time. You're in the company of that person and they do affect your mind. We can see that happening, right? Depending on the way um, people in leadership positions may speak or uh, the way they may, you know, engender fear or hatred of others. So we have to be careful with that and selective. So turning our attention away from something that's difficult or traumatic and towards something more uh, wholesome and, and supportive for us. Yeah. So again, it gives you permission not to see the person who's hurt you so, so terribly. You know, sometimes people write in to myself or to Ajahn Brahm and they say, you know, I'm in an abusive relationship but I should forgive them, I should make peace and be kind to them because they don't know what they're doing, shouldn't I? You know, shouldn't I be loyal? And, and I just think, gosh, you know, the first question really is, am I at risk of harm? And, uh, you know, you need to protect yourself, first of all. This is the most important thing in life. And of course, it's not always safe to leave a dangerous situation, but to try to create the conditions so that it is safe to do so, if that means protecting yourself or maybe protecting your children. So we don't have to put up with terrible behavior, you know, and we shouldn't feel that we have to be sort of stronger than we are, right? Maybe some of us are really, really sensitive people and we just, yeah, we just get thrown and too affected by even, even people who become mildly angry, you know, we have the right to choose. We have the right to choose who we associate with. So, and then the last one in the Buddha's five is uh, that if none of those apply, if none of those really help, to apply the law of karma. So to understand that beings behave the way they do due to causes and conditions, and they will reap the, the results of their deeds. You know? We don't have to think about bringing those results about. <laughs> we don't have to be the ones who deliver their karmic results you know, through um, seeking revenge. Usually if somebody has intentionally hurt or harmed another, they already suffer, whether they know it or not, you know, and they are going to, going to suffer more in the future. So reflecting this way can also help to bring a bit of objectivity and perhaps even engender some compassion to arise. So I wanted to obviously talk about forgiveness in the meditation process as well. And it might be easiest just to do that through some practice. But um, the basic idea, as I say, is, uh, is one of letting go and making peace. So forgiving our body, first of all, for being in the condition that it is. You know, it might not be perfect. You might have some kind of diseases in there, or you might have a body that would love to sit for three hours, but it'll only do 20 minutes. But can we forgive our body for that? You know, can I forgive my right hip, which is always in a bit of an uncomfortable position on this Zoom cushion and it starts to ache. I notice that if I start to fight with that, 
you know, I, uh, I just create a sort of solidified sense of, of throbbing or pain in the hip. But if I can just forgive it and say, oh, you're okay, you're doing really well, then it's like my hip goes, oh, thank you so much. And it just softens, you know, and the, and the pain just starts to dissolve. It's not really about pain, so don't worry about my hip. <laughs> and then just making peace with the moment. This is your moment. Yeah, this is your special moment. It's come to see you. It wants to know whether it's welcome or not. So even if it's not perfect, even if it's a bit kind of sickly or <laughs> a bit grumpy, whatever that moment looks like, this is come to see you. And the present moment is so often rejected by us. You know, it's got a kind of complex by now. It thinks, oh, I don't know if they're going to accept me or not. So can we just forgive this present moment and say, oh, it's OK, my friend, you're welcome. You know, it's like a mother. She might have two children and one of them's kind of really well behaved and conscientious and the other one's quite mischievous and naughty or perhaps the other one's just more melancholic in nature. Whichever child is in front of that mother, she's going to give them the same loving kindness, the same care, right? And those children's moods are changing constantly. So in the same way, like if you imagine these little moments coming in <laughs> when you close your eyes and you meet that present moment, it's like a child coming into your mind saying, you know, how are you gonna treat me? So can we forgive that moment for being the way it is and be patient and kind to it? So, Let's get into some meditation, shall we?